think we should start, right? Okay. Hello? Sure. Mm, everyone can. I guess people can hear me. So, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to, today we're having a case discussion uh, on our implant failures in the office of human fractures. So, Ms. Magez will be presenting, and then we'll take on it's just a discussion as, a, as you see as we go on. Welcome all the senior colleagues to this meeting. Good morning. Ms. Okay. Magez, I can start. Uh, thank you, Mposi. Um, I'm going to present on two cases, uh, and uh, there is no guru on these cases. It's a learning opportunity for all of us, and uh, everybody is free to stop me and contribute uh, wherever you deem necessary. So, case one uh, is a 37 year old gentleman who was involved in a road traffic accident. Uh, sometime in uh, 2018, uh, I would say about three and a half months before he presented to me. Uh, during the time uh, uh, of accident, it was not that his vitals were normal and he, on examination, he had an associated uh, right clavicular fracture. So I've posted uh, the pre-op x-rays, and I'll call upon the students to describe what they can see on the x-rays. All right. Any students to take on that one? Or I'll just call up one. <laughs> I'll start with final as, as usual. Hello, sorry. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Masenga Forte. Uh, the X-ray, okay. uh, the 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 picture shows the uh, X-rays of the um, uh, femur of the patient we are discussing. It's an AP uh, and lateral, but uh, both views are not complete. Uh, but what we can see is uh, a fracture in in a comminuted fracture at the junction of the proximal and mid with head um, with a posterior lateral displacement. And um, I think uh, it can uh, fit into a wink quist uh, type two with about 50% uh, cortical contract. Okay. Uh, what, what else are you worried about uh, in this particular uh, case? What do you want to know? And what other examination findings would you want to know? And what other X-ray views would you want to get? Uh, uh, this is a, a trauma patient uh, uh, involved in a high energy uh, um, um, sort of uh, trauma. So would want a full uh, a TLS um, um, uh, protocol uh, approach to this patient, and the, in terms of of, of X-rays, would want a chest X-ray, uh, a CT spine, uh, CT scan nowadays is recommended, and the and the pelvic uh, X-ray. Uh, we are worried about uh, 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 trauma to the C spine, the chest, uh, intra abdominal, and pelvic fractures, as well as. Um, yeah, I think uh, for the for the skeletal trauma uh, in ipsilateral um, neck or femur or dislocation of the knee or injury to the ligaments to the ligaments of the knee. All right, uh, so you're, you're quite right, and uh, it's quite common to have associated injuries with these uh, kind of injuries, particularly uh, high energy injuries. So you want to have a dedicated a view of the proximal femur, a dedicated view of the knee, among other things, because um, you can get uh, its lateral neck of femur fractures or associated ligamentous injuries. And in both cases, uh, it's around uh, for neck of femur, uh, different studies called six to 11%. Then for multi ligamentous knee injuries, 
uh, it's around 10% as well. So you want to be sure that all those things uh, have been evaluated. All right. So how, how, how you, you classify this factor according to Winquist? Uh, do we have any other takers and uh, who can describe the subfragmented factor of uh, FEMAS for us? Another fourth year, do we have Chataika? All right, uh, Dr. Betu, does this fracture fit in the sub trochanteric uh, group of fractures? And how do you uh, define sub -troch fractures? And uh, we also need someone to okay. give us another form of classification. So yes, Prince, you can go ahead. So a subtrochanteric region is the region which is uh, within five centimeters from the lesser trochanter of the femur. So they are classified according to the Russell Taylor classification with a type one, which extends up into the piriformis fossa, and a type two, which, ex which doesn't extend to the piriformis fossa. So I think uh, this it doesn't fit into the sub because it's just at the junction of the proximal third and the middle third. It's most of the factors involving the middle third of the shaft of the femur. So I would put it in the sub necessarily. Do you have another contribution, another student to give us his own or her own view? Is Dr. Nyawunji in the house? Yes, I'm here. Uh -huh. um, so on on this patient, it's more of uh, the fracture is more at the east mass, and um, unfortunately we don't have graduations on the X-ray to really measure the distance from the lesser trochanter. But uh, looks like there's a bit of uh, combination into the into the subtrochanteric region. Um, so some some cannot can classify this fracture as a subtrochanteric uh, fracture, but also noting the deformities on the X-ray, it may also classify it uh, as a subtrochanteric uh, fracture. Okay, thank you for that. So the reason why I put this um, uh, slide uh, is to agree with Gretu and also correct me. So the traditional description of sub fractures is that uh, it's a fracture which falls within the region between the lesser trochanter and five centimeters below the distal margin of the lesser trochanter. Then Wiss and Brian uh, in 1992 uh, did a study and noted that if some fractures which fall slightly distal to the, uh, the, the faucet region also behave as sub fractures, and then they gave a, 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 a description of sub fractures being fractures extending from the lesser trochanter to the junction of the proximal and middle third of the femur. So that means proximal third femur fractures behave like uh, sub fractures, particularly when they are comminuted. Uh, so in terms of behavior, this fracture actually fits into the subtrochanteric uh, fracture group, as Dr. Nyangu said, that if you look at the, at the X-ray, you see the deforming forces, or uh, 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 the pattern of the deforming forces, which fits into the subtrochanteric uh, group of uh, fractures. And worse so, when you do have uh, communication, uh, if, even if you look at the Russell-Taylor classification or the Felding classification, they also take note uh, of the fact that these subtrochanteric fractures can have extension 
proximally into the greater trochanter or can have extension distally to involve the, the, the proximal third or even up to the middle third of the, of the shaft of the femur. So, uh, where to mention the Russell Taylor classification. Uh, however, there's this classification which I want to show you, which is called the Sens Heimer classification or the Felding classification, which describes the fracture pattern, uh, the, the fracture geometry, and it's uh, grouped from type one, which is also subdivided into five classes. Uh, subclasses and also uh, type two, type three, and type four. So it suffices to mention that uh, there is no one uh, universal classification for these fractures. And literature calls up to, if not more than 15 different types of classification systems, which uh, as Mr. Govine, Mr. Vera always say, if you see so many classification systems coming up, it means not one of them is uh, uh, comprehensive. So uh, you find people do not talk much about sub, uh, fracture classification, but it suffices to know this uh, sense Heimer classification and the Russell Taylor classification because they will help you in uh, making your decision. Right. Let's touch a bit on the biomechanics of the uh, proximal femur. As uh, we discussed in an earlier lecture, we do have the iliosoas attaching on the lesser trochanter and causes the proximal fragment to flex and externally rotate. Uh, the short abductors with the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus, they also AB duct the proximal fragment. Then the adductor group of muscles, which attaches on the medial surface of the distal uh, femur shaft, they cause medialization of the fragment and shortening on the fracture side. So it's, it's very important to remember these uh, deforming forces because they have a bearing on how you reduce the fracture and how you fix it. Then, while on biomechanics, it suffices to, to note that uh, the, 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 the proximal femur is a high stress uh, concentration area with uh, compressive forces on the medial side and tensile forces on the lateral side. So you see the magnitude of the force just from standing on one leg stance goes beyond uh, 1100 uh, Newton meters uh, of force, which means there is a significant force uh, which is concentrated on the medial side and the bone responds by having a calca uh, femorale, which is a quite dense and strong uh, born there. I put this diagram because it will form the basis of uh, today's argument on how to choose the implants. Does anybody want to tell me how they're going to fix uh, the, the, the fracture we're discussing? So the you can go ahead, John. Okay, go ahead, John. All right. So uh, the fixation uh, of choice for the fracture in discussion would be a, a logged uh, intramedullary uh, nail. Um, the argument being that uh, it's just been said uh, that the femur uh, loads um, uh, the the, the the, the femur is, um, is, is concave antero, anterolaterally and uh, is convex anterolaterally and concave posteromedially. So it's loading medially. Uh, the medial portion will be in compression. Um, that needs a fixation device, which will be a load sharing device 
and also there's a lower a moment arm that is the force from the center of the femoral head to the middle of the implant. Uh, 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 that's the distance that we're using. So force times that distance gives us the moment arm. So the implant should be able to resist uh, bending uh, uh, forces. So a device which is intramedullary is better resistance to bending forces as compared to a plate-based device, which can be which will be put on the uh, convex side um, uh, of the bone. Then the other issue is that um, this patient, when they uh, start loading, uh, also the femur want to load its normal biomechanics of loading the medial side. So in this patient, the medial cortex is comminuted. So loading the medial cortex will also put a, a more bending forces on the fixation device. And uh, there's a high risk of um, a, a fatigue failure from a cyclic loading. So we're taking the two options, plate-based device and uh, intramedullary-based device an intramedullary based device would be better. All right. So, uh, Doc, can I just ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, you're a very vague young man. Which intramedullary device are you using? There are hundreds of them now. Okay. Describe so, uh, all the courses that are working there. Which device are you going to be using? So, it will be a long enough. Intramedullary device, um, which uh, the options which would be a kefal either using a kefalomedullary nail that is the proximal interlock lock into the neck, uh, or we can use a, a, a three in one reconstruction nail of which in this fracture con in this patient it can also do very well by locking into the neck or we lock into the lesser trochanter. Uh, all right. You, can you choose one, the best one that you're going to use? That would be it's very vague. The best for subtrochanteric fractures would be a kefalomedullary. For, for this fracture, this there's none of these fractures are exactly the same. This is a different fracture. Choose one and tell us why you're choosing that one against the others. Okay, we agree. We okay. We make we, now. You said you are not going to use a plate. Yes. Because of the problem that will arise with the plate, which is sitting mm -hmm. laterally in the in the tension side. Okay, you said you want the intermediate locked nail. You said which one? Choose one and tell us the reason why you're using that one. Um, I would choose um, a a kefalomedullary nail. Which one? Uh, the many of them. The many. <laughs> Uh, all right. As to how they, uh, they are, they are uh, the outcomes are comparable for 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 both in, with the ones which lock into the neck and the ones which lock into the uh, lesser trochanter for this type. So. With this configuration of fracture that you've got, and the, and the forces that Mister. Uh, 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 Magese has just shown you working around that 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 uh, compressive site. Ooh. Uh, I think From, can we have somebody else contribute? Yeah. I'm giving you the leeway that you use any name that's available on the market that you've read about. You just choose one and give the reasons why that is better than all the others. Is Tristan in the house? Yes. You are the final ears. Can, can you speak, speak madam? Can you speak? Uh, for, this, for this particular patient, I will use a nail. I will use a standard logging nail. 
uh, with which has got an, um, a trochanteric entry point nail because uh, a piriformis entry point nail would uh, also with the deforming forces would also risk the, um, the, the uh, will also risk you having a virus deformity and are not able to 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 attain a perfect reduction. So a tr trochanteric entry nail using a, a an entry point that is a bit medial but on the trochanteric side will help with the reduction. All right. Uh, so if you choose to nail this fracture, how are you going to position the patient? I'll put the patient in the lateral position and uh, options can be the lateral position or you can put the patient on traction table. It will also help with the reduction. Then when you are now you are trying to reduce, the, especially the proximal uh, fragment, you can make use of the shunt pin. You can also make use of uh, a femoral distractor and some uh, advocate reducing the fracture first before you try to find the entry point and dreaming the fragments uh, individually. If you, if you reduce your fracture first, then you rim once it will reduce your chances of uh, having uh, the virus deformity. And as I have mentioned, uh, an entry point that is a bit medial, but still trochanteric and not piriformis entry point. Um, I think um, on entry point, you really have to be clear because especially for these very prosthetic chance of going into virus if you go through the trochanter are higher. So you have to really mention where on the trochanter or is it on the vast area because they will go into virus if you, your entry point is wrong. So you have to, I think you have to read around and find, and also take note the nails are different, different manufacturers, different entry points. Yeah, uh, hello? Hello? Yes, can you Brian? Yes, I think uh, there is need for a point of correction there on what uh, Dr. Mugodo is, uh, is mentioning. Was in a structure like this one, you'd want some, something that is collinear with the trajectory of the, of the shaft, which is what uh, Dr. Mugodo is actually trying to mention. That, those are the pros for, for, for putting a nail which is in, in the performance. Actually, with the trochanteric entry nail, you may actually risk a malalignment into, in, into virus. So, uh, Dr. Nyawunji also did mention, is this nail a, a retrograde or an anti-grade nail in terms of options, which one are, which one are you choosing and why? Or like what Mr. Ferrari is trying to probe in, into asking. So the, the nail also be, not be okay. You can go ahead. Okay, the nail will be an anti-grade, um, uh, anti-grade nail. Uh, why? Because we have better control of the proximal fragment, which is shorter and is more deforming um, forces that we want to control. Uh, so uh, an anti-grade approach would be better. Then the most of the nails that uh, are on the market are trochanteric entry nails for this type of fractures. But to counter it, uh, having the mal reduction in virus, that's when it's encouraged to uh, medialize the trochanteric entry point. So we're going just medial to the tip of the of the greater trochanter, and the other um, uh, pitfall is rimming before. Uh, reducing the fracture. So we have to reduce the fracture first. Either we, uh, we're using a fracture table or uh, we're using an assistant uh, to, uh, to pull. So the, the proximal fragment is the one which is most difficult to control. So we have noted that it's in abduction in, and externally rotated. 
so we can either make use of the, dis uh, the freely mobile distal fragment by pulling it to length to reduce the shortening, externally rotating it and abducting it. Um, that can help with the reduction. Then the other pitfall when we're using a fractured table is to also leave the, uh, the distal uh, fragment in, in internal rotation, which will give the patient problems with mobilization if it's more than uh, 20 degrees. So to, counter, to counteract all those things, um, we have to remember the, the behavior of the, of, the, of the fracture and reduce it as I've just mentioned. Then it's better to use an undergrad and nail. Um, then to try and answer Ms. Tibera's question, um, uh, what I have come across is that uh, in these uh, proximal femoral uh, fractures, for a patient with a good bone stock, we can use the conventional uh, nail locking into the lesser trochant. But for a patient with a poor bone stock and they have a subtrochanteric fracture, then we need to lock into, into the neck uh, to, to get a good um, a proximal interlock and also to reduce the risk of getting a neck of femur fracture. Okay, so I think uh, this discussion uh, uh, final is you have to take note that there are various uh, generations and they have different configurations as in the proximal, how thick the proximal um, end is, what angle the proximal end is, how many screws do you lock into the, into the neck. So you have to be very clear which one you're using, its complications. Uh, so for movie, for, we can move forward, um, but you have to read around that area. Because you can, uh, can spend the whole talking about this. About this. Can, can I just make a comment? Yes. Dr. Lalazi? Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. I think when we looked at those uh, classifications, you, you, yes. you showed us that the fracture can come in all shapes, the various uh, uh, for, uh, degrees of combination. So some. Uh, uh, some trauma surgeons now are suggesting that uh, we have to do a CT scan routinely just to check that there's no occult fracture in the neck. But there's quite a significant number of, um, of diaphysal uh, fractures actually uh, are also complicated. Just something to think about. Some even go on to do MRI scans just to look for a dimple. But some of these fractures, when you fix them, some patients will start complaining of uh, chronic hip pain. And uh, some others have found that this, this hip pain is due to these fractures which, have, which would have been missed. Now, about uh, cephalomedullary nail or looking through the trochanters, I think, you know, I don't think really, I mean, there's, I think it's Dr. Chim Tembo who mentioned that, you know, if it's an elderly patient, you want to put a cephalomedullary, if, the good, if there's good bone stock, you want to put, a, a, to look through the trochanter. It's a very good point, uh, but we should never forget that you should also use what you're comfortable with. Because sometimes, you want to, I've, I've used some intermediary nails, cephalomedullary, which are e extremely complicated, you know, in my hands, and the results have not been very good. So it's just a point of, uh, from my own experience. Uh, I don't think we mentioned the, the reduction here. We mentioned about the joystick, which is very good, but I've had to open a significant, a significant number of these fractures especially if there's a communication, because some fragments of bone actually will block your entrance into the distal fragments. These are just uh, my thoughts on this uh, topic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gova. Uh, thank you, sir. I think you, you clarified and put it um, uh, nicely there. 
Uh, so the surgeon who managed this patient uh, first probably didn't have the armamentorium, which you guys are mentioning. And uh, this, this was his post-operative result. Can we have uh, a student to comment on this uh, fixation? Yeah, um, this is the, this the, the fixation with a, a plate, which I'm not quite sure. It looks to be a compression, uh, uh, dynamic compression plates, which is uh, applied on the ensor side of the femur. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, my comment on this, uh, there is very high uh, compressive forces on the medial side uh, of the, the femur. Uh, so, uh, but mechanically, uh, very high uh, risk of loss of fixation. And uh, and uh, and the non uh, that is in terms of biomechanics and in terms of uh, techniques, uh, it's, uh, there's so much dissection there with a uh, high risk of uh, infection. So um, I, 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 I think that is not a proper situation. Uh, anybody else um, with a different comments or additional comments? Okay, um, in addition to uh, what uh, Dr. Ngoi has said, um, in terms of uh, this fixation, um, um, we can see that um, the patient put, uh, the doctor, physician, orthopedic surgeon decided to put a, a, a DCP, but um, looking at most of his screws, a lot of them are actually in the fracture site, um, and especially distally. I think I can only maybe identify one screw, uh, the, the most distal one, which is um, uh, probably bicortical. Uh, in addition of the, the, the biomechanics uh, resulting in bending of your plate, this uh, implant may actually also have a very little pull out strength. So you would find uh, that maybe even before your plate bends, you could actually get all your, 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 your distal screws are, are pulling out because there is no good uh, cortical patients. Some of them are going into, into the fracture, the majority. Okay, do uh, what do you think about the rotation? What is the uh, what do you think about the rotation? Uh, right, yeah. in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of rotation, I think maybe I would, I would be happy with the, um, with a complete uh, X-ray uh, showing uh, the joint in above and the joint below. Okay. Dr. Um, Jodai, okay. you want to say something? Yes. Dr. Jodai, you are saying this fixation method, what is this fixation mod method that was used? Okay. So, so uh, I'll also try and uh, uh, clamp it up into your question. Uh, the question for the final is what are the it's like what are the plate functions on on fracture uh, fixations different plate fracture functions I guess that's what you're asking Dr. Jinjembo. I don't yeah, know if you get my question. Has got, uh, uh, different holes. Uh, you can have compression. Uh, that is uh, one of the role. The second role is. Uh, uh, and we use it in the tension uh, band wiring. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be used in uh, buttressing. It can be used uh, in uh, in uh, bridging. Sorry. Uh, then bridging. Bridging, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the in a severe combination, again, it can be used as a. A bridging plate, and um, it can be used uh, for neutralization as a, a neutralization plate. Okay. That's all right. So, or in this function, in this image, what do you think it's working as? Uh, I think in this uh, in this picture, uh, the the surgeon would he would try he's, he was trying to to. Uh, 
I think he was trying to bridge the the but the the bridging is not proper properly applied. He was trying to bridge the the fratricide, but it is not properly uh, properly done. And it's okay uh, for uh, on academic purposes. The final is you should uh, get to know this more about the plates, its functions, and also some. Um, like um also you have to know what is what is uh plate span well, what is the stress distribution and what is its significance Describe them. This density. sorry uh let me try check. that's what i want to try and check they are different you know the ones with the two and the ones with four mm -hmm. are, are you and the different sizes yes at least in four. Mm -hmm. See, like this. Pamela, are you starting with us? It needs to be an interference. And she's yeah. on the phone. Yeah, it's an interference. So for for plating of uh, femur fractures, uh, when you are forced to plate a femur fracture, of which there are clear implications for plating a femur fracture, in a patient with a... Um, uh, where they had an injury before and they have an obliterated canal or they have a deformity which cannot allow the uh, use of um, a locked intramedullary nail, then it depends on the fracture configuration. If it's just a simple fracture which you can achieve compression, then you can do um, use the, the tension bend principle uh, using the plate whereby you're putting the plate on the convex side, um, um, allowing uh, also compression on the convex side, which is natural intention. This only works when the medial cortical buttress is intact, which will allow compression in the medial cortex. Then the other, um, if in, in comminuted fractures, then you'll be using the bridging principle uh, of which, um, the recommended plate size that we have to use is to be three times the length of the combination. So looking at this particular fixation, the plate actually is ending, it's actually not spanning the whole uh, uh, fracture combination. So that makes it, um, that gives this construct a high risk of failing. Then there's a significant medial combination uh, um, so the plate would be uh, completely uh, weight bearing and it will suffer more uh, fatigue failure. Then the bridging technique, uh, they said it looked like the surgeon was trying to compress the only cortex, the only 25% cortex which was left, which is seen by those uh, unicortical screws, uh, five unicortical screws in the middle. Um, of which it won't really help anything since it will make the construct a bit more rigid and, uh, and try to heal a severely comminuted fracture by um, a direct, um, uh, by primary bone healing, which is not possible in this, in this fracture. So a bridge plating would be better because it would be relatively stable and it would allow a callus formation. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Hello? Uh, can, I, can I just uh, say something, Marcus, with your permission? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. We, we are spending a lot of time discussing this uh, x ray. I know, I mean, look, this, this is entirely wrong. You know, the, the treatment given here was wrong. <laughs> and I don't think we should count the number of screws or anything. <laughs> It's wrong, even if you put 20, 30 screws, whatever. I mean, this is a deficit of fracture. We know the principles. I think let's move on and discuss what we should do. Yes. What we should do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir. I, I think that's exactly what I was going to point out. So, John had one head of the presentation, uh, uh, and this is what he was uh, trying to illustrate that uh, the compressive forces or the bending moment of the implants is equal to force times distance, of which the distance is uh, from the line of force to, the, to where your implant is. 
So this is our D and this is our So if we've got an intramedullary nerve closer to the line of force and thereby it shortens the D, whereas if we've got a plate, the distance is longer. So I will not waste time on that. So one week post-op and the patient was on strict instruction not to wait beer, uh, but he came back with it. Uh, quickly, one student, Ngoi, can you tell us what you can see? Hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, I see uh, X-rays, uh, post-op X-rays, uh, AP, uh, on the of the left femur, showing the uh, fixation. Oh, with oh, I find the problem, if you think there's a problem, if you think this is the same as the immediate post-op, then just say it, so that you catch up on time. I'm sorry, there was an interruption. I couldn't get the, the question. What but, is the problem, Doc? Yeah, uh, uh, what we are, we are seeing here, it's... Uh, Something is happening here. What is it? Yeah, I, I see uh, some... The, the plate is bending on the, the flatter sides with uh, lateral apex. And um, I see uh, close to the, the flatter side some okay, of so the fine boy, we don't have much time. So okay. the plate is ready to bend. Uh, would, would you have done this presentation? Uh, sorry, there, there are so much interruption this side that I can't get to the question. All right, we can get another to, to answer. Uh, John, Tracy, and Kujoka. Okay, Kujoka, you're on the mic. So, like what Mr. Govan was pointing out, that this fracture can be hideous. Remember, we were all saying this is far distant from the five uh, millimeters, but you can see this line is going up there. So it's truly a subtrochanderic fracture, isn't it? But the plate is also starting to fail. So now my question to Kujoka is, will you do anything at this particular point in time? The patient was on strict non-weight bearing instruction and he was following instruction, but still the plate is bending. Yes, um, at this point in time, I, I would uh, interfere surgically. I think for this patient, uh, the, my option would be to remove the plate and uh, use a uh, cephalomedullary uh, nail. All right, so we said, okay, keep on not wet, wet bearing, and one month post-operatively, this happened. Yeah. Uh, my comment would be if this patient was strictly non weight bearing, because the deforming forces that we described, the muscle forces, especially um, the, the adductors working on the distal uh, 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 segment of our fracture, would still continue to, to pull your plate. And because there's no med medial uh, uh, cortical abutment, your, it, uh, the, the fracture. The plate would 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 uh, would, would get a uh, uh, this uh, virus uh, 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 collapse and paint, and eventually your plate would, would break. Even if it didn't break, your patient would then uh, you with a, a mal union with with um, a, a virus uh, uh, deformity. So from the initial onset where I noticed that my plate had started bending, I would have removed it and put a a, a, a cephalomedullary nail. Okay, uh, I, I think um, this discussion is almost over, but we are in agreement. So um, you, you, you've answered that, how would you address this complication? And uh, my good colleague went in, revised, and put a longer plate to uh, cool. agreeing with John. He agrees with John that you can put a very long plate and it will work. <laughs> Um, <laughs> please don't laugh. <laughs> All right, so I'll leave it to you to comment. So one month post revision, this happens again. And that's when the patient uh, presented to me 
So now that we have this happening, all those areas of lucence, um, and the force is working against us, uh, for the students, what, what kind of mode of implant failure is this? What mode of failure have we just witnessed twice in one patient in less than a month? That would be fatigue failure. Okay, can you fatigue failure to us, please? Quickly. Uh, it, uh, the implant will be um, undergoing cyclic loading. Um, so since this plate is a completely uh, weight bearing, even if the patient uh, is not weight bearing, it suffers from cyclical loading. Um, and depending on the, um, on the stiffness of the material, it has a limit to the, how much of the cyclic loading it can, it can bear before the implant uh, suffers a, a fatigue, a fatigue failure. So where, where, where is this force coming from if the patient is not weight bearing? Um, it will be suffering from um, um, just if the patient is weight bearing on the non affected limb, just the weight um, of the non weight bearing limb uh, gives um, a cantilever bending at the, at the fracture site then also the deforming forces uh, to the fracture fragments also loads the implant all right so the argument is that uh when you are completely not weight bearing you are going to have a joint reaction force of about uh, three times the body weight just because of the pull of the abductors and abductors trying to carry that joint so that force is transmitted across the film so you still have a significant amount of force being transmitted across uh, your fracture fixation. So it's not like when you say the not weight bear, then the fracture or the hardware is not is not carrying weight. It's actually carrying weight more than the body weight. Then the other thing is uh, what about infection and the patient's biology. So I think that those things, HIV tests, diabetes, and both were negative. You are not using any drugs, especially steroids. Uh, of course, you are just using uh, uh, diclofenac for the pain. His full blood count uh, panel was fine, and the inflammatory markers were normal. So how do we proceed from there? OK, so for the sake of time, uh, we managed to get a three-in-one reconstruction nail, and because I had this, a good amount of proximal segment, I, I managed to use the reconstruction locking into the lesser trochanter and another transverse one into the lesser trochanter again, and use two prostatic uh, interlocks uh, distally, and uh, this is what uh, we got. Can I have any? Comments or critic? Well, my comment is this is what should have been done in the first place. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just wonder, you know, from the uh, two x rays that you showed us what the surgeon was trying to achieve because we don't teach. Uh, uh, our students to to plate these uh, fractures of the diaphysis. Okay. And there's one speaker said at the beginning that there are special circumstances in which you have to plate the femur. And I think most of us know those uh, circumstances. And the other thing is, uh, Mr. Magaza mentioned a very important point. You know, this case was becoming more and more complicated, and it was being complicated by the doctor, actually. You know, um, the chances of infection are high. And, uh, you know, one now is to do a lot of dissection to remove the, those plates and uh, that can devascularize all these, uh, some of these uh, uh, fragments around the communion. 
So I think this is a very good lesson for all of us. Uh, if you don't have the proper armamentarium, it's better just to refer the patient to a center where one can actually uh, 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 obtain these uh, uh, implants. Don't hide the patient and do you know, strange things in your hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. And, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Dr. Magiesa. Um, I think it also uh, points out towards uh, being a long range in orthopedics. I don't think, uh, even if uh, um, you know, you've done uh, a lot of surgery, it, it, it won't take anything away from a surgeon to get a second opinion from a colleague. Just, you know, just asking uh, your, your, your colleague whether in the same institution, in a different institution, even if you've done I am naming several times. You know, just to send an x-ray and run through somebody. Uh, I have this case, what do you think? I want to do plating, what are your, uh, opinion? what are your opinions on this? You know, it's, it's, um, it's quite sad to see a patient having to suffer at the hand of uh, the same surgeon. And the other thing is when you get a, a failure in the first scenario, like after the first, first uh, implant failure, that surgeon could have still asked for a second opinion before embarking on a revision for the same thing. And, and, and uh, this as well will still not take away anything from a surgeon. And thirdly, if you find an implant uh, failing at the first time, I don't think revision would have, would have mandated that you repeat the same thing with just slightly different implants. So according to the surgeon, I think different implant was a, uh, a longer plate, but it's still a plate. If, if one construct fails, most likely it will fail again for the same reason why it failed the first time. So if plate fails, opt for something different. It, in, in most cases, it will be an IM nail because probably the first decision was wrong. So surgeons, let's ask each other, do not hide with the person, you won't lose anything. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, uh, can I just mention? Yes. I think uh, with, with the subcroacanteric fractures, everybody gets, you go through a learning curve but try and learn from, from the others. Uh, Subtrochanteric fractures are hell. Uh, and you're going to get non-union, you're going to get implant failure in your life. That is because you've chosen the wrong implant in the first place. The lesson here is choose the right implant in the first instance. And if you've got any medial cortical defect, you must take into account all those forces that act on that place. So if you haven't got the right implant, send it to somebody else, else or get the right implant. Because this sort of thing does a lot of hell to your own confidence. So you must make sure that the things that you can't do, give it to somebody else. Because your confidence is really at risk and you will be fighting yourself in the end. Uh, and this is a lesson. Plating of these things with the medial cortical defect is a no-no. Okay, thank you, sir. I will just rush to the second case because most of the points are the same. Uh, this time, it was a 34-year-old male patient presented uh, in November 2018. Uh, but, um, okay, yeah, to the, to the initial uh, surgeon following an RTA vital no associated injuries. And again, a subtrochanderic fracture. This time, I, I think no question that this is a subtroch. And, and this is a different surgeon. We, we have um, that construct again. I think the, uh, the, the point remains the same. Um, so from post-op on strict nine bearing and uh, this happens. All right, so taking notes from what uh, colleagues have said, uh, this time the patient checked the doctor and then uh, we recommended that we revise and put an intramedullary log nail. And we got that uh, uh, outcome immediately post-op. Uh, can we have uh, a student uh, to comment? 
was there some learning things from from this construct hello can we have a so, training ap radiograph this is an ap radiograph show post um cephalomedullary nailing of the of the left femur uh, using a, a, a proximal a pfn proximal femoral nail uh, with uh, one um, interlock into the into the neck of femur um, uh, the fracture looked uh, severely comminuted and the construct is in in varus um, maybe in this because of um, a more of a trochanteric entry point um, uh, of the nail, as we can see from the from the X-ray. All right, yeah, slight virus, which is what I wanted to, our colleagues to see, and this uh, highlights to what have been pointed to earlier on that is is good to medialize the entry point and uh, reduce the fracture. I would say. I ring this nail uh, in um, uh, after removing the plate. I reduced the fracture and rimmed in a reduced position, but uh, still got a bit of 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 uh, virus. What size nail did you use, Mr. Magis? Do you remember the size of the nail? I'm just trying to look at the diameter there. I uh, can't remember completely, but I think it was a 10. Okay. Well, the other thing, the other thing is uh, also if you use a, a larger diameter nail, it can sort of help to prevent uh, the slight virus deformity. But I think that one is filling the canal well. So I think it's just part of the deforming force that way it played there. Yeah, it also being a revision, it was difficult to, to move the media. So you actually to get... Uh, a, a cortical alignment on the lateral where, where I was seeing was, was direct reduction uh, was a hell lot of um, a fight. And as you can see, there was a bit of colors forming. Uh, you can see the step of this is the post op, and there was a bit of colors forming. So that was actually resisting my, my reduction there. Okay. Uh, I think, Mr. Mageza, this, you, did, you did this very well. And uh, I wouldn't worry much about that, you know, virus. Don't be hard on yourself. And uh, with this uh, VA combination that we find on the media aspect there, uh, on experience, there is almost always that slight virus. You know, even if you go, mm -hmm. your entry point is more medium. So I think that's, look, that's, that's the best you could have done in this case. Okay, Th thank you for that massaging comment, sir. Uh, so the pitfalls that we commonly note in these fractures are virus malreduction, rotational malreduction, and leg length difference, particularly if there is recombination. So you need to put um, uh, equal leg length. Then miss the lateral injury, like what Mr. Gova uh, highlighted earlier. And sometimes the missed injuries are occult and might mandate you to do a CT scan. In actual, in one Chinese paper by Chai and colleagues, they, they noticed that um, if such a neck of femur fractures uh, were 50, in 50% 50 of the cases, uh, the bulk of which were not visible on plain x-rays. So uh, you need to be uh, very, very aware of that uh, these things can actually okay, including the knee, lig knee uh, ligament as we put it earlier on. Uh, just a comment, just a comment. Yes, sir. Um, let's everybody be clear. Even if you choose the right uh, implant to for these fractures, you can still get a non-union. Which is very common. I think the, 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 the non-union rate is up to about 
in some papers. The question now is that I've always asked myself is when you have these uh, subtrochanteric fractures and you've done everything, uh, you've rimmed and you've got all this stuff in, can you put in um, bone graft? What are people's comments on bone graft as an additional insurance that this thing? Hello? Can we have a comment? I think bone grafting is, is, a, is a very good idea. And uh, I mean, I've, I've come across some papers and some people who, come, who routinely bone graft if they severe communication. Would you also, I, I think you would also. Uh, would, would the remains be. Uh, Brian, can you go ahead? So I think when when you are when you are doing the operation, it will also help to when you are reaming, you keep the the, the reamings yeah. and then yeah. use them the, the, the bone graft, and also it will also help to do a dynamic dynamic locking rather than a static locking. Yeah, I think the reaming product. You you put your end up. Uh, hello. I think um, I think uh, bone grafting is a is a really good idea with some of these uh, subtrochanteric fractures. But uh, I've also noticed that if uh, I, I don't know about uh, other surgeons, your comment on this. Uh, if we harvest uh, bone graft from the pelvis, sometimes even if the fracture the fracture heals, the patient has more morbidity or continuous regional pain on the pelvis than. Uh, the fracture site. So because of that, I've uh, now kind of changed. I, I harvest most of my bone graft from the uh, tibial plateau area because I've noticed that it recovers faster and patient uh, really gets any, any mobility after that. What are your comments on this? Thank you. Maybe you if you take your bone graft from the tibial area, do they immediately wait be because your goal is early function? So, so do they not have pain that limits their early, early mobility? This is the goal of surgery. And uh, also the uh, amounts that you get. Uh -huh. So in most cases, uh, uh, it goes with the, with the usual protocol of uh, non-weight non bearing period. So, they recover the, the harvest, uh, the bone graft harvest during the same time. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I've seen they do recover quite, quite well, really, except for the, uh, you know, small surgical scar that you get. They rarely have any local, local pain that is persistent with those that have the pelvic bone graft harvest. Okay. All right, so the issue of bone grafting subtrochanteric fractures or not uh, bone grafting uh, is still contentious in literature, uh, particularly when people were using plates, plate-based devices, there was so much talk on um, bone grafting and with the uh, intermedullary nails where you don't strip uh, the, 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 the fracture segment, Union rates are quite more than when you, you, you do open reduction. So I think it's something which is, the jury is still out. But as we have said, uh, we are more now agreeing that um, uh, nails fare much better than uh, plates. And a lot of people are now not rushing to bone graft unless they are dealing with a non union. So as a tag home message, uh, we've noted and we've agreed that uh, subtrochanteric fractures are challenging to treat and there are massive deforming forces which must be overcome uh, by the surgeon during uh, your reduction and the implant which would have cho chosen to, to withstand the high load which uh, is transmitted across the fracture segment whether you ask the patient to not wait beer or you ask them to wait beer, that implant should be uh, strong enough. And currently, 
uh, M nails have shown a reliable results in union uh, and plating techniques, which have had uh, which have been sort of researching uh, in the immediate past. Uh, have shown poor uh, results uh, against the uh, benefits, and the resurgence was mainly due to the uh, coming up of locking plates. And people thought now that we've got locking plates, they are supposed to do much better, but clinical results uh, showed that uh, it's not the case. And more research is being, uh, done, particularly on these shortcomings, and uh, hopefully that will lead to improved implant uh, design and uh, operative techniques, especially you know, reduction techniques, uh, percutaneous and stuff like that. Then also um, advancements in nailing uh, focuses on percutaneous reduction instruments uh, so that you don't strip the soft tissues and also the various uh, proximal locking options so as to get a better fixation of the proximal uh, segment. So this marks the end of uh, today's discussion. I don't know if there are any more parting comments and encouragements from the floor, well, from the senior colleagues amongst us. I want to just to ask a question about the uh, uh, supplies to the mid shaft of the femur. In terms of uh, uh, in uh, non-union, a, a, a femur which has uh, initially uh, managed with uh, a, a nail, then the, there is non-union. Uh, some uh, literature says that uh, the plating with grafting has got a higher, uh, better outcome as compared to the, the revision with uh, with uh, exchange nailing. Uh, I, uh, I I'm not quite sure about uh, which uh, if it remains still a controversy or if there is a, a definite, a clear uh, approach on that. Well, I didn't get your contribution. Are you suggesting that revising with the plate based device uh, would better outcome? Or is just a question? Or... Oh, yeah, I, I, no, I, I want to just have a, 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 an opinion on, from the seniors. Uh, the, some literature say uh, after a nine, if there is non union after a nailing, after the initial operation with the uh, intermediate nail, uh, nail, if there's non union, uh, you, you do the, you revise with plating plus acting. And uh, they are saying that the outcome in terms of uh, uh, union rate is higher. Uh, as compared to exchange learning. Yeah. So uh, when we discuss discussion about that, I, I want to just have uh, uh, an opinion uh, from the, the senior about that. So what is in literature concerning uh, non-union post-logged uh, intramedullary nailing to try and manage it initially is doing exchange nailing um, but when we exchange the nail, we have to rim, uh, so that improves the biology at the fracture site. Then also dynamize the nail, like Dr. Uh, Mr. Chintembo has said, that usually gives a, a, a good union rate for a non-united uh, fracture femur using low intramedullary nail. I, I think for Dr. Ngo, it depends uh, with the nature of the study. You may just uh, possibly give us a reference for, of the paper. I haven't come across that one. I think the yeah. help. You can, I you can send it. the study. I saw it in the, the Miller 2019. Yeah, we'll look it up. You can, you can send the study on the group, then we'll look it up. But I, don't, I still don't think uh, it's really complicated. It's a good study. Any more contributions? Um, um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, my network was on off, on off. I just wanted to make a comment when the crafting in the initial on the initial operation. I think it's a little bit counterintuitive because they've got a fracture site. It means for you to graft, you have to open it in the first place, and you've got a community fracture, and we know community fractures tend to yield their problem is not the, the biology. If you if you want bone grafting, 
then you have to open it, you're devascularizing an area of low or poor blood supply or ages, why at least you want to graft and we don't know what percentage of them are actually going to have a non-union. So I think at the end of the day, you might be over-treating the patient and causing some problems at the, at the beginning before you face them. Yeah, I do agree with Moya there. Uh, Mr. Sasanuri, you had something to say? Yes, um, I think what Doc was referring to, there's a lot of work that has been done in Egypt, in Korea, um, for non-union of uh, these subtrochanteric fractures, which had been uh, uh, fixed, uh, intra uh, locked intramedullary device. And the first uh, um, consideration is to do exchange nailing, like what Dr. Nyaunzu said with Rimi. But some have also done work where you leave the original nail in and you go and bone graft and augment with a plate um, on the non-union uh, fracture site. And so I think that's what he's referring to. There is a lot of work um, that has been done to that effect. And results have been good either with exchange nailing, uh, with the... Uh, augmentation with a plate and bone grafting, or you leave the original nail in situ and you um, augment with a plate and bone graft. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So I've posted um, a chapter on non-union of subtrophic fractures from the latest uh, edition of uh, Rotwood. I will leave um, a participant to read was with more comments uh, from the floor. Dr. Samoy, where do you end up? Then Dr. Mangiro. So start with Samoy, then Mangiro. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I had put it down because some of the things had been covered. But anyway, I wanted to comment uh, uh, for trainees. They would need to know that trainees would need to know other types of uh, fatigue, uh, other types of uh, implant failure, I mean because it seems the majority would remember fatigue failure, but there are other forms of implant failure that they would need mm -hmm. to learn, you know, fetal failure, plastic failure, to mention some. So uh, they shouldn't focus only on fatigue failure because there are other ways in which implants fail and they are expected to know this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Manguero? Manguero? Manguero, may you please unmute your mic? Or while he's sorting the technology out, Mr. Tamatang, you have got something to say? Yeah, um, good morning to you all. So, um, possibly you, you probably did what I'm going to suggest, but um, I think it would be important, even uh, you know, when you see such patients, who then even if they are not referred by the initial treating surgeon, just, you know, to communicate, uh, hello, doc, how are you? There's this particular patient um, that you're managing that I saw, and this is what happened, and this is what we had to do. Because we need to prevent um, these things in the future. We need to assist some of these surgeons who are not uh, really understanding the principles of um, uh, fracture management to, to, to somehow, I don't know how you can put it, maybe diplomatically teach them to adhere to the principle. So it's, it's important because I've seen a, a number of cases where patients shop around, yeah? And then um, you get to know that, okay, the initial treating stage was so-and-so. But of course, because they're a colleague, sometimes senior, more senior than you, you can't tell them, say, no, what you did was wrong. But I think what we just need to be able to do is to just give feedback, even if they are not the ones that referred. To say, oh, Chiremba, I saw this particular patient that you once saw, and uh, so they then came and they fractured uh, around the plate, and this is what we've done, so now they are, they are doing okay. I don't know, um, it's just um, my thinking. Okay, thank you for the contribution, Mr. Chita. Uh, Mr. Mangiro, we are 15 minutes uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I guess it was just a comment on an established non-union and bone grafting or exchange nailing. 
I, I think when you have an established non-union, we just need to, to remember that uh, there is a probably a more comprehensive way of assessing the patient and, and Calori has provided a platform for that where you're looking at all these things, whether it's the biology, the, the growth factors, you know, maybe the, the diamond concept was the initial fixation adequate was the fracture open, then other f patient factors and so forth. So I think just to say when you have an established non-union, just to say bone grafting or exchange nailing is not good enough and that's uh, classification by calorie provides a, a scoring system which actually shows you whether you can do this thing um, just like you know exchange nailing or you need to do more fancier things ahead thanks yeah. okay thank you that, that's uh, very correct I think uh, uh, people are focusing on the implant uh, forgetting that uh, non-union is what more more to do with it than uh, the implant but um, I'm sure the, the, the piece is slide there uh, to what you've said. So if I will invite uh, the last contribution, if there's any burning question, uh, contribution. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. All right. um, thank you everyone for the presentation. That was a very good presentation and uh, good for the final experience also. Very, very broad, um, got many uh, aspects of orthopedics. Uh, so I'll encourage them to read more. So today they can read more on implants, failure modes, and all the same biomechanics and the materials. Thank you for this presentation, uh, Mr. Marquez. See you on Friday. Thank you. See you Friday.